Asia and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian and who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and who's on the bottom of the list? Saul. Verse 1, right? So while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This is the first missionary journey. This is the birth of missions right here in the church at Antioch. The church was flourishing. Barnabas had a tremendous, tremendous ministry, and now Barnabas and Saul are being set apart by the Holy Spirit and sent out for the first missionary journey. It was on this first mission. You're probably wondering, where are you going with this already? You're going to see. You're going to see. So they're, they're getting ready to leave, and John Mark accompanied them. We see this in Acts 13, 13, where it says, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphia, and John, John Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. No details are really given. He's a returning missionary from the field. Sometimes people misunderstand returning missionaries. We don't always know the situation. But if, if, one, thing, if one thing is it's not carefully seen, we might pass over it. And it's really significant. It, it, it was on the first missionary journey, the first missionary journey, that Saul became known as Paul. So you got Paul, you got, you got Barnabas and Saul, then it's Barnabas and Paul, and then we're going to see it becomes Paul and Barnabas. This is all by design. So it was on this, this first missionary journey, Acts 13, 9, we see that uh, Saul was called Paul. Now, so from this point on, Paul is mentioned in the lead role. It becomes Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. And I see in this a tremendous humility in Barnabas. Excuse me, Paul, don't you realize who I am? I'm the one that got you in the door. You would have been left outside if, if I didn't take you by the hand and introduce you to the apostles who didn't want to have anything to do with you because nobody was believing in what you said that you had been redeemed. Uh, no, Barnabas was content with that position. Paul and Barnabas. Kind of, kind of helps us to recall John the Baptist, doesn't it? He must de increase and I must decrease. Now, jump back over to, back to um, Acts 15. We get a truth about the second missionary journey. So, look with me in Acts chapter 15. And starting at verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. In all honesty, you could preach a whole sermon on verse 36. This is one of the missing pieces of the puzzle in evangelism. Somebody gets saved, and where are they? Oh, I don't know. I, they're saved already. They're, I, I go on to the next person. Well, how are they doing? I don't know. I just entrust them to the Lord. That's not what they did. They want to have a whole other missionary journey for no other reason than to go back and see how they're doing. They want to see that they're continuing on in their faith. Let me just read down to 40. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord to see how they are. And Barnabas was desirous of taking John, called Mark, along with him also. And I know you're all familiar with this. I'm not here to debate who was right, who was wrong, what was, what was it all about. That's not, I'm not even worried about that. You can hammer that out. 
Barnabas was desirous of taking John. They were related. John Mark and Barnabas were related. They were cousins. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. So, what happens to Barnabas? You say, we never hear from him again. Well, we, we, we will. We will. But we don't hear about him the way we did in the first uh, 15 chapters, basically, after the church got started. Barnabas was a key figure in the mind of Luke, and now he's off the scene. What's going on? Well, one thing we can be sure, he wasn't just idle. He took Mark with him. We don't know what they did, but we read a lot about what Paul did, don't we? I mean, we know where he is every step of the way. Is that the last we hear of Barnabas? No, no. Luke no longer refers to him by name, but we can be sure Barnabas was very, very busy being the encourager. Who is he with now? Mark. What did Mark need? He needed some encouragement, didn't he? So the Lord placed him with the right person at the right time. Now, here we are. I said all of that to say this. We've got two questions I want to ask. All, just all that history, to boil it down, to try to make one point. What would have happened if Barnabas did not take Paul by the hand and convince the apostles of the legitimacy of his salvation? there would have always been question about the Apostle Paul. Is he really, really an apostle? Is he one of us? Is he one of us? There may have been continued questions about the, in the Apostles' minds about Paul's ministry. But all that was settled. In fact, it was settled so beautifully. Turn with me to Galatians 2. I want you to read this. This is really something. Look how well... The ministry of Barnabas was in the life of Paul that something like this was able to happen. Galatians 2, 7 and 9. <clears throat> but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, this is Paul talking, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. So Paul was the commissioned apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was the commissioned apostle to the Jewish people. For he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. So what does Paul do? He puts him on the same level as Peter. He's, he's one of them now. And this, how do we know that Paul wasn't just exalting himself? Because look at the next verse, verse 9. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, what did they do? They gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. So in other words, Paul and Barnabas when they continued on, were given the right hand of fellowship by the apostles and go in peace, go in the strength of the Lord. You're one of us. That happened, that happened as a result of the ministry that Barnabas had in the life of Saul of Tarsus and Paul the Apostle. When he was trying to get in, the door was shut. Barnabas takes Paul by the hand and says, come. I'll, I'll, I'll get you there. And not later, I'll, I'll show them the work that the Lord has done in your life. What about Mark? What, what, did, what did Barnabas, what effect did Barnabas have on Mark? Well, as a result of the ministry that Barnabas had to Mark, 
he became a very valuable servant to the Lord. He, he wasn't just known as the one who dropped out in the middle of the missionary journey. 2 Timothy 4.12. This is Paul's last letter. What does Paul say in 2 Timothy 4.11? Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark. Bring him with you. For he is useful to me for service. Word must have got around. There's been some changes in Mark. What do you think happened? He was hanging around with who? Barnabas. What do you think Barnabas did to Mark? He encouraged him in the things of the Lord. Now here's, here's my last point, and this is all I want to tell you. From a human perspective, the way that God used Barnabas boils down to this. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament. When you combine Mark, the Gospel of Mark, with the letters of Paul, 103 chapters were written by these two men who were influenced and encouraged by who? One man, Joseph Barnabas. If you want to minister, be like Barnabas. Be like, oh, do we need Barnabases? We need to encourage people, young people, just starting out. Older people who've been on the job for a long time need encouragement. I tell you, I, and I have to be careful because I, I, I'm wired to, I'm wired to June 3, to contend. Fight for the faith. Anybody that knows me knows that's where I'm coming from. But you got to have an encouraging spirit. Give me people a, give them a break. I, I mean, I, I, people, I look back at my early ministry, people were so patient with me. I mean, I was, I, I was stumbling around like an idiot, trying, wanting to do what I could for the Lord, and people needed to take me aside and, and help me. And, I mean, I honor those people today. They're with the Lord now. People allowed me to do things. I'm, why did they do that? I'm looking back. Why did they? I was so young in the Lord. I guess they just sensed that the Lord had his hand. And I know that the Lord has his hand on some of you here. And you need a Barnabas to encourage you on. Mark came off the field. He would have been considered a failure by, mo by some people today. Not with Barnabas. Barnabas saw potential. Barnabas saw potential. Mark stumbled. He had a difficult time. But Barnabas got a hold of him. Next thing you know, he's writing one of the Gospels. I'm not discounting the ministry of the Holy Spirit, understand. But <laughs> there's a human element here, too, that we don't want to ignore. The Apostle Paul. <coughs> Couldn't even get an audience. People didn't even, after years, they didn't even believe, they still didn't believe he was a, a, a true believer in the Lord Jesus. <coughs> and then Barnabas comes along. And Barnabas was willing to leave the church in Antioch that any pastor would be drooling over. So many people are getting saved. And what, what does Barnabas do? Hey, I'll be back in a few months. I'm going to look for somebody. Most pastors wouldn't do that. They, they like that, that kind of light, too much shining on them. Barnabas was a very unique individual. He was an encourager. And, and he looked to encourage. He, he definitely had others in mind. From the time he sold the property that he owned, didn't have to, and laid the money at the feet of the apostles to be distributed. Hey, wait a minute, this is my money. I'll distribute it the way I want it distributed submitted to the whole system. And I think God, when you're, when you're humble like that, God exalts the humble. And God exalted part of us to give him a, a wonderful, wonderful ministry of encouragement. We benefit when we read the New Testament, don't we? When we read the epistles of Paul and the Gospel of Mark, just remember that it was Barnabas who was humanly used by the Holy Spirit 
to help these two young believers along so they would be able to accomplish what God had called them to do. Well, Heavenly Father, help us to be like a Barnabas. Help us to look for opportunities to encourage people, to help people who are questioning and trying things and stumbling and doing things that are just outright wrong by maybe not having enough knowledge at the time. Help us to be encouraging to them, leave them alone as Barnabas led Saul and Mark alone. What great results of Joseph Barnabas and his ministry. We thank you for it. We don't exalt him. We exalt you who worked through him and the Holy Spirit who gave him these gifts and these abilities and how he used them so wonderfully. May we use our gifts that you've given to us in the same fashion. In Jesus' name.